Hello, my name is Anthony Ricciardella. I'm with the Materials Characterization Lab in the Materials Research Institute at Penn State University. And today I will be talking about 101 ways to measure film thickness. So what is a film? So it's usually a planar device whose length and width is much larger than its height. Um, it could be freestanding, could be on a substrate, could be uh, anything from coatings to membranes to layers in a semiconducting device. Key properties that people want to know about films typically are the thickness, obviously, um, its roughness, um, physical properties. Um, some of these you can get for free depending on the techniques that you use to measure the thickness. Um, these might include optical constants, conductivity, um, various things such as that. And then, of course, reproducibility. Um, if I measure um, samples, um, how much variation is there from sample to sample in my devices? Um, measurements are typically either destructive or non-destructive. Um, so pay attention to that when you're choosing which technique to use. So let's start with what I call everyone's favorite film, the mantle of the earth, because nobody that I know uh, enjoys falling into lava. So how would you measure it? Um, you can measure it directly. Um, the deepest hole that people have ever drilled is about 12 kilometers deep, and the outer layer of, um, of the crust could be um, as deep as 100 kilometers. Um, so that has some limitations. Um, seismologists use seismic waves. Um, there are two types of waves, P waves, which are compression waves, and S waves, uh, which are called shear waves. Um, and the important property here is that S waves are unable to transmit uh, through fluids or gases. So at the core mantle boundary, S waves can't continue into the liquid core and they suddenly disappear. And P waves are strongly refracted or bent. This points to two approaches that we can take to measurements. One is you can measure um, the thickness of a film directly, or you could use the properties of a wave. That wave could be light, could be sound, um, could be something else. Um, but the properties uh, that we would use are the phase of the waves, the polarization, uh, interference between the waves, attenuation, things like that. Um, direct measurements are easy to interpret, but they're usually destructive. You either have to cut the sample, blast it with an ion beam, do something else that allows you to directly measure the thickness of the film. Wave measurements are generally non-destructive. Obviously, the Earth is still here, um, even though we can measure the, the core mantle boundary. Um, but typically, they require a model to interpret. If you get the model wrong, you'll get the wrong result. It's helpful to compare the range of thickness measurements um, that we're going to be making, uh, typically in the lab, to the electromagnetic spectrum. So electromagnetic spectrum ranges from uh, radio waves, which might be on the, the size of a football field, um, all the way down to gamma rays that are smaller than the nucleus of an atom. Um, generally speaking, the range that we're going to be interested in is um, about in this range here that goes from um, the thickness of a piece of paper at, you know, millimeter, a fraction of a millimeter type scale, uh, down through microns. Um, the wavelength of light would be 380 to about 700 nanometers, um, and all the way down to the atomic limit. So the uh, distance between uh, two layers of graphene uh, in graphite would be less than about 0.7 nanometers. Um, so this gives you an idea of the types of wavelengths that you might want to be using to measure the different thicknesses. Um, if your film is very thick, you can get away with using uh, long wavelength uh, light like IR. If your film is very thin, um, you may need to use something closer to X-rays. On the millimeter to micron scale, um, I'm going to use a color code here for all of the different types of measurements that I present. Um, we use uh, this kind of teal color for uh, non-destructive, red for um, possibly destructive measurements uh, that are made across a step edge, and uh, purple for uh, probably also destructive measurements that are made in cross-section. So if your film is on the order of about a micro, uh, micrometer, um, you can get away with using a dial gauge. Dial gauge has a resolution you know, down to the micron limit. Um, so you can measure uh, the height of your film um, of your substrate before you grow and then after you grow the film and just see what the, how much it's changed, what the difference was. Um, you could also just measure across the step of a film. Um, optical microscopes are also good in this range. Um, calibration slides are cheap um, you know, if, you're, if your microscope isn't calibrated. Um, and if it's uh, transparent, you can use a microscope with a calibrated Z to focus on the top and bottom surfaces. Um, optical profilometry is also um, another technique that you could use. I'll talk more about this later. Um, again, you would just focus on each of the surfaces and see what the distance between the two of them is. Um, on the tens of microns to hundreds of nanometer scale, um, you have more advanced micros uh, light microscopes like uh, confocal microscopy. 
Um, this is, these are limited by the wavelength of the light that you're using, um, and your samples have to um, be transparent. Uh, so the absorption length needs to be uh, longer than the sample thickness that you're trying to measure. Um, a um, kind of more specialized technique in the same category would be confocal Raman. Um, and the film would need to be transparent, and it's non-destructive um, as long as the laser power is low enough that it doesn't burn your sample, and you can get a Raman signal um, with decent uh, uh, Z resolution as you focus through layers of the sample using the properties of the confocal microscope. Another option uh, would be uh, IR, um, ultraviolet, or visible spectroscopy. Um, it's a nice example here of how um, the colors of uh, plates of steel actually change with the thickness of the oxide on them, uh, given half their history of how they were heated. So this is one of the uh, the first uh, techniques uh, to actually measure film thickness that was uh, well understood. Um, you can just measure the film thickness by looking at it with your eye and seeing the color. Um, and this is due to oscillations in the spectra that occur from light waves bouncing off of the top surface and bottom surface, very ser similar to how Bragg's law works. Um, Another good example of this would be uh, thermal oxide on silicon. You can look up entire tables of how the colors change uh, based on the thickness of that oxide. Um, you can do the same thing uh, in a more specialized uh, spectroscopy um, setup. Um, so with IR, for instance, you can look at uh, interference fringes that occur as you measure uh, with different wavelengths, and then you can model this and back out the film thickness. Going down to the nanometer range, um, you have a couple of other options. You can use a stylus profilometer. Um, this is a uh, very simple, uh, very fast measurement that just rasters a tip across your sample and uh, measures how the topography changes. Typically, you'd have to measure across the step edge for this. Um, optical profilometry um, is also an option here. Um, you may have to do some extra prep steps to make it work. Um, I'll give you some examples later. Atomic force microscopy, uh, also a great tool. Um, ellipsometry and reflectometry are non-destructive techniques um, that you might want to look into if you know the uh, optical constants, uh, like the uh, refractive index of your material. Um, scanning electron microscopy, um, either uh, doing edge on by taking a lamella um, using a, a focused ion beam. Um, there's also a nice technique that we have in the MCL uh, called uh, uh, layer probe with uh, EDS measurements. Um, which can help um, measure the thickness. I'll show an example of that also later. Um, X-ray uh, photo emission spectroscopy, XPS, or secondary ion mass spectroscopy, SIMS, are also uh, techniques that are available here. Um, you can do a depth profile with ion beam etching, um, or if you're below about five nanometers, by varying the incident angle, you can actually model the spectra that you get um, and back out thicknesses that way. Um, of course, transmission electron microscopy is also um, another technique. Um, just look at the sample, it's a very direct measurement, um, but it requires a lot of uh, prep, um, and um, I'm not gonna go into it too in too much detail, but um, obviously you can get some amazing information out of uh, TEM. Um, and the last technique that I wanna talk about is X-ray reflectivity um, and X-ray diffraction uh, for epitaxial films. Um, this is um, my area of expertise. This works really well for um, very flat films without a whole lot of surface roughness um, with thicknesses from nanometers up to a few hundred uh, nanometers. So with that, let me give you some examples from real materials. First example is confocal Raman. Here you would be looking for the Raman signal as you scan the Z-focus um, below the surface of your film into the substrate. So an example here is boron dope diamond on diamond. Um, this would normally be an extremely difficult uh, thing to measure. Um, so on the left, uh, we have a Raman spectra of what a bare diamond surface uh, substrate looks like. Um, in the middle, we have uh, what the Raman spectra of boron doped diamond is. And as you scan the Z-focus through the material and watch the changes in the spectra, you can start to see where the uh, boron signal um, in diamond starts to uh, decay. And uh, you can use that to measure where the uh, end of that layer is. So for this uh, sample, uh, when it was grown, they used a dial gauge to measure the surface of the substrate and then uh, the surface uh, after depositing the film and got a thickness of about 23 microns. Um, by using uh, confocal Raman, they were able to measure a thickness of about 26 microns in this case. This example uh, is profilometry with pattern devices. 
So you could use a, a stylus profilometer to um, just get a uh, section uh, across um, some direction in your sample. Um, so I apologize that this uh, black image is a little bit hard to read, but you can see here um, steps uh, in a pattern device. Um, this technique is really fast. Um, the only thing that you need to be careful of is that if you have a very soft material, it might scratch your device, so be careful about that. Um, AFM um, is um, a uh, more gentle technique if you uh, need the added resolution. Um, it also has the uh, benefit of giving you a full image of what the surface looks like. So this example here is a um, example of contacts on an exfoliated flake of a 2D material. Um, there have been a couple of contact uh, electrical contact pads put down. And if you measure um, across the green line, uh, you can get the thickness of the film here, which was about uh, seven and a half nanometers. And if you measure across the red line, uh, you can see the height of contacts, which in this case was uh, slightly more than 15 nanometers. Um, this also gives you, um, you know, information about uh, the roughness of the film, uh, variations in the topography. We can see that there's um, a little something going on at the edges of the flake that might be leftover photoresist. Um, very powerful technique. Um, optical profilometry uh, is also a, a, a very powerful technique, um, and it's a pretty cool one too, because using optical um, visible light, uh, we can actually get um, images of the surface with sub nanometer Z resolution. So not only do you get a visible image of what the surface looks like, you also get the Z information of um, how high it actually is. And again, you can do uh, roughness measurements and things like that. Limitations here are um, the films uh, need to be, if the film is transparent, it needs to be uh, thicker than about a micron to avoid interference effects with the light bouncing off the top and bottom surfaces. Um, so these two examples are etched features, um, but they're applicable to thin films. Um, the one on the left here is a etched silicon carbide substrate, uh, where you can see after doing the etching, um, we can measure uh, how much material is etched away. Um, on the right, um, this was a example of a timed laser dose array um, that was made on a 250 nanometer thick photoresist. And what they wanted was to figure out as they expose the photoresist to a higher dosage of um, laser uh, light, um, what is the effect, effect on developing the resist? So normally, uh, 250 nanometers of photoresist would cause this problem of interference between the top and bottom substrate, uh, top and bottom interfaces. In this case, this was removed by coating the photoresist with a uh, thick layer of uh, metal. Metals are um, opaque, so um, what they could do then is directly measure the surface of the metal, and you can see the depth of uh, the developed regions of the photoresist going from top uh, left being low dose to bottom right being uh, increasingly higher and higher doses. Example is uh, ellipsometry and reflectometry. So these are techniques that use um, wavelengths of light from uh, the ultraviolet to the infrared uh, to model uh, what the thickness um, and optical constants of the material must be. So um, in this example here, we're looking at the reproducibility of approximately 1.2 micron thick um, 3012 resist that was spun on silicon. Um, this was an undergraduate project that was done in the nanofab this summer where they were looking for the reproducibility of spinning um, resists um, in the nanofab. And both techniques uh, were used for um, multiple uh, spins that they did, um, giving similar results for both. Um, they measured an average thickness of about 1.25 microns. Um, they give results um, within a few minutes. If you're using uh, standard materials like photoresists and silicon, they're very good models for modeling this. Um, if you are down to very, very thin films um, on the order of um, nanometers, you may find that ellipsometry is a more accurate technique than reflectometry um, because ellipsometry measures both the intensity and the phase of the light that's reflected off the surface. So. Um, these are, uh, in the bottom um, part of the slide here, these are um, data that I pulled off of uh, J.A. Willem's website um, showing how the reflectometry uh, of the surface 
um, is basically uh, indistinguishable for a uh, five versus two and a half nanometer thick um, oxide on silicon, whereas by looking at the phase shift in the reflected light, um, you can very easily tell the difference between the two of these. And the ellipsometer in the clean room is very nice. It has a, a stage on it so you can do wafer, wafer mapping um, and see variations across your wafer. Um, only limitation here is that if you are using a material that you don't know what the optical constants are, um, you will have to develop a model for this. And again, you have to be very careful that the model it correctly describes your material, otherwise you'll be getting uh, incorrect measurements. X-ray reflectivity uh, is a technique that um, is near and dear to my heart. This is what I do in the X-ray facility um, in the materials characterization lab. Um, it is very good for uh, thin films up to a couple of hundred nanometers thick. So um, you know, 200, 300 nanometers is probably the limit. Uh, with the optics that we have available. Um, but stacks of multiple layers are possible. People often use this uh, for measuring um, layers of um, heterostructures with repeating units in them. Uh, you can get very complex reflectivity patterns, but they can be modeled um, exactly in order to pull out uh, the properties of the entire stack. Um, so the example that I have here is a um, uh, silicon uh, germanium film on top of a silicon wafer with a 25 nanometer silicon cap. Uh, the silicon germanium is about 50 nanometers in thickness. Um, and this is a uh, NIST uh, standard reference material um, that we use for calibrating the instruments. Um, and as you can see here, the spectra that we get is complicated. It has all sorts of wiggles in it, um, but it can be modeled almost exactly. Um, so in this case, um, we get that the thickness of the capping layer um, is about 25 um, nanometers, and the thickness of the silicon germanium was um, 48 nanometers, um, plus a little bit. Um, additionally, XOR gives you information about the density of the layers um, and the roughness of each layer. Um, this is um, a great technique uh, for uh, checking other um, film thickness measurements against. Um, it's non-destructive. Um, it takes about um, half an hour to an hour uh, to get uh, a good measurement out of this. Um, and, um, you know, if you have a sample that you've measured, um, just submit a, a, uh, an analysis request and we would be happy to, to do that. Uh, samples down to about five by five millimeters would be about the smallest that we can go to, um, up to you know, full uh, two or four inch wafers. So putting this all together, I want to give an example of um, another one of the uh, undergraduate projects uh, over the summer. So they were looking at um, platinum uh, that had been deposited on silicon, um, and they wanted to figure out um, whether the thickness of the platinum was really what they thought they were getting from the evaporator. So nominally, this was about five nanometers. They did ellipsometry um, and got a, a pretty good fit to the model that gives a thickness of about 9.2 uh, nanometers. Uh, we went and did uh, XRR, and initially we got a very bad fit to the data, um, unless uh, we started to add um, an extra layer on top um, with a very low density. Um, once we did that, we were able to get a, a reasonable uh, fit for the XRR data, and this would give a thickness for the platinum layer of um, about 5.65, um, if we don't count uh, whatever the top layer is, you know, up to 7.2 if you say that the, the top uh, low density layer is part of the, the platinum. Um, additionally, uh, cross sectional SEM was done on this sample. Um, so the sample was uh, cleaved and then measured edge on in the scanning electron microscope. And um, down at these uh, levels, um, it could be a little bit hard to focus on the film. Um, but we have some very good uh, scanning electron microscopes that are able to do this. So um, there's also some geometric effects, um, depending on whether or not you're able to look exactly edge on or not. So clearly we're, we're um, looking um, a little bit uh, canted above edge on. Um, but the thick film thickness here that was measured was about 5.6 nanometers. So what's going on? So the plan view, uh, the, the top view of the, uh, the film in the SEM um, clearly helps to identify what's uh, what's the issue here? You can see 
in this image that there are clearly grains with voids between them um, on the surface of the, the platinum. And those voids um, are probably leading to some of the low density that we see. Um, the XRR fit the density of the platinum layer at about 15 grams per cubic centimeter, uh, whereas a uh, bulk uh, platinum film you would expect to be about 21. So that's entirely consistent with there being voids in the film. Also, the grains um, seem fairly uh, rough, so that we probably have some sort of porous surface here, which is contributing to this top layer um, with this uh, low density. Um, so this is a nice example of how you can take multiple techniques and use them to check one another and figure out what's going on. Um, so going forward now, if we wanted to use ellipsometry, we would have to refine the model, add an extra layer to it, and then we could use it to give us uh, accurate results of the film thickness. Um, one last technique that I want to highlight is uh, EDS layer probe. So EDS is energy dispersive spectroscopy. Um, this is a uh, technique that's available on the scanning electron micro uh, microscopes. Um, and um, we use this also to look at the platinum film. Um, it's a relatively new technique. Um, we don't have a whole lot of experience with it, but it looks quite promising. So what you do is you get a uh, EDS spectra, um, such as uh, what's shown in the bottom here, that shows you the elemental composition um, of the sample. And usually EDS, um, you know, the majority of excitation volume is about a micron deep in the material. But what this software will do is if you give it a model of what your sample looks like, it will look at the attenuation of the peaks, the um, area under each of the peaks, and it will fit um, either a thickness um, or a uh, uh, density uh, to each of the layers um, and will back out um, what, the, uh, what those properties are for your film. Um, so in this case, uh, we overestimated the density uh, because we didn't have the XRR results yet, but um, we got a, a thickness that seems quite reasonable for, for these. So if you're interested in this, talk to the staff um, uh, in the SEM lab. So in conclusion, did I present 101 ways to measure film thickness? Well, no. But I hope you've gotten the idea that there are a lot of options here. Um, and there are many other techniques also that are available um, that may not be available in the MCL. Um, Rutherford backscattering would have been one I would have loved to cover. Um, these are uh, often available at other universities, and there are companies like EAG um, that will do a lot of this analysis um, for a fee um, that have huge amounts of experience um, you know, from going back for many years supporting the semiconductor industry um, doing these types of measurements. Um, two points. It's always good to measure your, uh, to verify your results using two methods, um, at least at first, um, until that you verify that you are getting uh, consistent results. Most techniques will give you more information than just thickness. Um, so use that um, if you're getting it for free. And also some techniques that you're already using may be able to give you film thickness um, in addition to um, what you're already using the technique uh, to do. So. Last point would be um, talk to the staff about your needs and the materials that you're working with. Um, there's a lot of expertise down here, and they will help guide you to the right techniques. So, thank you. I hope this has been helpful, and uh, look forward to seeing you around the lab.